Our scripture reading today is Psalm 61. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So I will ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In the 18th century, God led a number of now famous missionaries to devote their lives to bringing the gospel to the Asian subcontinent, specifically to India. William Carey is one such missionary, and today you may know he's often referred to as the father of modern missions. There are others, though, that are integral to the story of Christianity's growth in India. One such name is Dr. John Thomas. In 1783, he went to India in the employ of the East India Company as a surgeon. Uh, while there, as he gazed upon the vast host moving on in solemn procession into the valley of death, he decided he could watch idly no more. And one writer writes, he put his neck under the yoke of the master and began laboring to deliver them. On returning to England in 1785, just two years later, he was baptized, he was licensed to preach, and he went back, this time to Hindustan, to see people saved. After several more years spent in preaching and trying to translate the New Testament into the Bengali language, he returned to London, this time to seek additional funds for the mission and to find a partner for the mission. Well, in God's divine providence, he connected Dr. Thomas with William Carey. And they returned to India, this time, according to one author, the first two Englishmen to enter the Orient for God and not for gold. And what awaited them there? Pain and trial and uncertainty and years of a tough mission that nothing could have prepared them for. One author documents, it was hard to find a suitable place for the establishing of the mission. And in the meantime, Carey, William Carey himself wrote, I am in a strange land, no Christian friend, except for Dr. Thomas, that is. A large family and no way to support their needs and wants. I anxiously desire a time when I shall know the language as to preach in earnest. William Carey, upon entering in 1785, waited seven years before the first convert came forward, preaching faithfully seven years and beyond that. Poor Dr. Thomas was so overjoyed at that new convert that he quite literally lost his mind. His mind gave way and he had to be confined to the mission that they had set up, the building. And on regaining his mental balance, his health was never the same. His health had much broken and he died a few months later. His life an unselfish offering to India. Now, his work was cut short, but he became an encouragement to other missionaries, including Adoniram Judson, if you know who he is. And he showed Judson what enduring faithful missions looks like. And in 1817, Judson wrote this. If anyone asks what success I meet with, tell them to look to Bengal where Dr. Thomas had been laboring for 17 years before the first convert came forward. 17 years, likely filled with immeasurable distress and questioning, God, where are you? Did you not promise to go here with me? 
into this dark continent, which they called it at the time because it was like looking down into a bottomless pit where no one knew Jesus and having very little light other than the word itself to guide the missionary forth. And you can imagine those years filled with distress as the promise that God had given Dr. Thomas and Dr. Carey, and he gave to many others that he would be with them as they go, as the promise did not seem to be lining up or supported by the present plans and the way the plans were working out. Because as the plans were working out, people were saying no to the gospel for seven years for Carey and for 17 for John Thomas. And we kind of find a David in Psalm 61 with a similar sentiment in a similar time of his life where he's under much distress. And as we've looked at Psalm 55 now through 61, and we will continue to proceed as we move through the Psalms this summer, we are in a time in the Psalms and in David's life where life is not a sweet gallivant through a field of tulips and rainbows overhead. He finds himself in caves. Today he will say, I feel far from you, the ends of the earth to be exact. And he faces distress after distress. His, his, if you remember a few weeks back, his own son chasing him, Absalom wanting him dead. It's, it's a difficult time in his life, and he certainly has distresses, as Dr. Thomas did. And we're going to look to Dr. Thomas and mostly to David to say to our spiritual fathers, what did you do when that happened, Dad? Tell us what you did, Grandpa. Tell us the stories of where the Lord provided, and how did you find the strength to rely on him in your distress? And we're going to let our spiritual great-great-great-granddad tell us today, and he's going to point us toward the rock that is higher than all of us. So let's hasten to the text, and we're going to divide it in three sections today, each with, each with its own proposition, and they're, they're divinely connected, and, and we'll piece them and reason them together as we move through the text. So first, we're looking, going to look at verses 1 through 3, and I want you to see this first. God is an impenetrable fortress for his people. And boy, do we need that, an impenetrable fortress, when we are seemingly running from our enemy with no weapons in hand, beaten and bruised, needing protection. He's an impenetrable fortress for his people. Let's look at the text, verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For, meaning because, you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. If you could look and see with a magnifying glass my Bible, you would just see all these colored highlights and these key words underlined. There's definitely some key phrases in here we're supposed to not miss because they, they help us formulate really important illustrations for understanding who God is and how he operates during our distress I I underlined faint and rock, and I drew a line between them because, I mean, is that not a juxtaposition? The weak human about about to is swooning, falling onto this immovable rock. When I think of rock, I can't help but think of Plymouth Rock. I loved learning about the pilgrims and stuff when I was a kid. I loved U.S. and world history. And when I was a kid, I thought, why don't they just move it? It's just a rock. Pick it up and move it and put it, you know, in a in the Smithsonian or something. And then as an adult, I took my kids to see it, and the thing's the size of a car. And I was like, that's a rock you're not moving. And the Lord is a rock you're not moving. Amen. Amen. Uh, the Lord is an immovable rock, and when we are faint, we need something to catch us. Have you ever done trust falls? More better question. Have you ever seen trust falls go wrong? Well, I trust you. And then, then your friend accidentally, oh, hey, looks the other way and there's no one to catch you. Well, that doesn't happen with the Lord. He's an immovable, the Plymouth Rock is such a bad illustration because it could be moved if we were determined enough, but the Lord will not be moved. And when man and woman are faint, they can lean on this rock. Underline strong tower. This is second key illustration in the first five verses that David uses to describe who God is in times of distress. He's a strong tower We see this language commonly in the Old Testament. Here, he is a refuge, meaning protector, protector, protection. Now, I'll give you four or five seconds. I want you to visualize a strong tower. Some of you went to a tower you saw 
from your childhood in a children's book, you may have thought of something you saw on TV recently, or an actual castle you've been to, or a fortress, if you've been to Fort Sumter or someplace like that, you probably visualized the innermost place of safety in one of those buildings, but all of it doesn't do justice to this strong tower. I think of any one of the towers from any one of the Lord of the Rings movies. And particularly, I think of number two, strong, the uh, Helm's Deep. And now you don't, for this illustration, you don't have to know anything about Lord of the Rings or be a nerd about it like me, about Tolkien or Lewis or anybody like I am. But just know this, King Theoden and all his troops and all the elves and everyone is making their final stand at this fortress, which is set in a valley. They've retreated to this fortress, meaning they're on the run from the enemy. And it's night, and it's not a great time to do battle. And Theoden says it has begun, and the war takes place, and the walls are breached. And where do they go as their last line of defense? If you, now, if you know, you know. They go into the tower. It's their last line of defense. And what happens? They barricade themselves in, and they're preparing to die. And they're saying, what a glorious death this is going to be, or whatever men have to tell themselves in that point of view to make this worthwhile. And what are the women doing? Hiding in a cave, weeping. What are the children doing? Either fighting or weeping. Everyone's worried. Everyone's fretting, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Well, we don't run into our strong tower that way. And to try and take this illustration and let our human perceptions of the last line of defense pervert what it means that God is our first and only line of defense, we sell him short. Amen. And we do him disrespect for the strong tower, immovable rock that he really is. He is a refuge for his people, an impenetrable fortress. And therefore, we don't run into our tower fretting with weeping and gnashing of teeth and tearing clothing. We run in celebrating and waving banners of victory. God is an impenetrable fortress for his people, verses 1 through 3. Now, let's move to verses 4 through 5. Now, David has a reason he believes God is a strong tower. What's the reason that God is a strong tower? Well, he evokes that reason in verse 4. Let me dwell in your tent forever. There it was. Did you catch it? Did you catch the reason? Well, it's hard to catch because we're not Israelites. But he just said something profound to us that tells us this, point number two. God has chosen his people forever. In other words, when you belong to God, you belong to him permanently. And I got that from verse four. Do you know why? It's because of the word tent. Underline it. Catch this context. Because an Israelite reading this would have heard that and said, our Lord does dwell in tents. Our people have dwelled in tents. When God first made his covenant with us, where were we? In tents. Now, as Americans with brick-and-mortar homes, there's a, there's a brick building around every corner, right? Not for the Israelites. A strong tower is a pretty big deal. But for us, we read strong tower. How, so he's a strong tower and he's a rock. And then we read, and he's also a tent and a bird's wing. He's a, he's, a, he's a meager tent that can get blown over by wind, and he's, a, and he's a bird's wing. Have you seen how brittle a bird's skeleton is? Well, bear in mind, these illustrations each mean something different. The rock is immovable. The strong tower gives protection. And the tent and the bird's wing speak to the Israelite position back in the desert. Look at specifically the tent, because if you look at Exodus 33, back in the desert, when God was telling the Israelites, I will be your God and you will be my people. And the Mosaic covenant was days old. What happened? Well, in Exodus 33, God appointed Moses to set up the tent of meeting. And what would happen at the tent of meeting? God would come down in a pillar of cloud. And what would happen? They'd worship him. He'd, be, he'd welcome the Israelites to come know him. So by saying, I want to dwell in your tent forever, I believe this is a very likely reference hearkening back because he's already said, you've been, you've been my strong tower. Did he not use past language? Back up in verse 3, for you have been my refuge. Not you are, you've been. It's your reputation. And you've been the refuge for our people dating back to when we were just in tents. You were a strong tower when we lived in tents. And, the, and Moses was in the tent of meeting, and the pillar would come down, and we'd be welcome to come worship you. You welcomed us for the first time to be your covenant people. And I'm going to have to use the word covenant a lot from here on out, because he's, he's evoking language 
of the covenant because he knows he relates to God through the Mosaic covenant, which was given back in tent days. And what does he say to this God? I take refuge under the shelter of your wing. Now, my baby girl, who is almost two, she knows right here is a very safe place. And with mom, it's like even safer. It'll change, I think, when she's like three or four. But right now, it's like mom's even safer. But she's, she's so naively trusting that sometimes she'll just fling her body back. You ever seen a baby do this? Just like too much trust, they just go, bye, mom. And they fling their bodies back or try to do this. And then so they just know you're going to catch them. They know that when mom or dad is holding them, I, I have a absolute safety here. This is what a mother hen, a mother bird does to her, her chicks. She welcomes them into the inner place. This is beautiful language to dwell in God's tent and be welcomed under the shadow of his wing. So, so catch this. God is an impenetrable fortress for his people. And David's, in D- David's faith is able to rely on that truth because he's looking at the history of the nation, which he's the king over, and he's, he's evoking the language of the covenant which was given. You've kept your covenant. You've been a God of truth. You've been our refuge. So now in my present distress, do it again, Lord. The context for crying out to him now is on the basis of the fact that he's been helping people in distress every day. And now David asks for the same. So God is the impenetrable fortress for his people. God has chosen his people forever. And now we see in verse 6, God maintains his covenants and invites human participation. So think about it. God has maintained this covenant with Israel that David is now evoking and saying, Lord, I'm your, I'm your covenant child. Help me in my distress. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You've been my refuge. Be my refuge. I want to dwell in your tent like my father Moses did. And I want to be welcomed into the shadow of your wing. And, but look at the language now. Because so far, we have David in the present. And now we have the past over here where his people were in tents. And what does he do now? He looks forward. Look at verse 6. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I, David says, so will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day by day. So he's now, as he's invoked the past and the history of Israel up until now, knowing that the covenant is the basis by which he asks God for this help, he asks for continued help for the king. But is it just him, just the king? Well, you have to ask yourself and reason from the text. When it says, may he be enthroned forever before God, is David asking to be made immortal, like the fountain of youth would give him everlasting life or something? I don't believe so. I believe the context for chapter 61 is 2 Samuel 7. And there's four or five word clues that would support that. So I I underline in verses 5 through 7, I underlined my heritage. You've given me a heritage that fears your name, the Israelite heritage, because he knows he has the biological nation of Israel going back to the days of the tents. He has his spiritual fathers going back to the days of the tents. His heritage, may his years endure forever, forever uh, before God, may he be enthroned forever before God, and may steadfast love and faithfulness watch over him. Prolong the life of the king. Well, if you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, I want to read verses 12 through 16 to you. Before I do, let me give you a brief context. What I'm about to read is from the lips of David. David was already king. He did not yet have a son in Solomon who would be his heir. And he had it in his mind. He had a great idea to build a house for the Lord, a temple for the Lord. And he wanted to do that. Because, to quote him, he was living in houses of cedar, but the Ark of the Covenant was in a tent, and he wanted to bring honor to the Ark of the Covenant and wanted to build God a temple. And, spoiler alert, God said no. But this is God's full response. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. 
that sounding like the prayer of Psalm 61? I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So will that son live forever? No, meaning the kingship of Israel will last forever. And did it? Through Jesus, who comes from the lineage of David and Solomon. So we're seeing prophecy about the coming eternal king. I will be to him, I will be to Solomon, a father. He shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men, which means we'll have a healthy relationship. But my steadfast love, there it is, key word, my steadfast love will not depart from him. So why am I bringing this up? Because that's exactly what he just prayed. Preserve the lineage of the king. Let your steadfast love be the thing that preserves it. May the, may the throne of Israel endure forever. He goes back and says, Lord, the thing you promised me in 2 Samuel 7. He wouldn't have said that. They didn't have the, they didn't have it divided that way, but that's how I'm saying it. The thing you promised me when the prophet Nathan delivered your words from your lips to my ears, do it. Do it. So why would he be asking God to do it right here in the middle of his distress? I'll use Abraham and Sarah as an example. God said, you shall have a child. Not only that, your descendants will measure the number of the sands. And they said what? We're too old. How can we have children? We're not of childbearing age. David is saying, Lord, if these distresses kill me, how is this promise going to come true? Lord, it, I remember the promise you gave me to give me a son. And remember, I said Solomon wasn't born. This is a king without an heir, and we know too many stories to know that kings need their heirs and want their heirs. Uh, we know too many English kings who had... Seven wives, one of them, trying to find an heir. But this isn't about getting an heir. This is about the prolonging of the throne, that it may honor God in the land of Israel, that God would give him a son that would build a temple. Think of the promises he's asking God. Lord, save me in my distress, not just for my good, but for the good of the people, for the good of the ark, that it may come into a, a brick-and-mortar beautiful house that honors your name. And sure, that I may have a son, because sons are good. So there's the motivation of needing salvation from this distress. There's why he needs a rock. That is why he needs a strong tower. And why he wants to dwell in the tent of the Lord forever, because that's the Lord he's honoring. That's the, ki the kingship is supposed to honor that God. And he wants, likely, though this is inference and it's eisegetical, he likely wants a son who's going to honor the Lord the way he has. He wants a son that's going to live in the tents of the Lord forever. So we see God is this impenetrable fortress in our distress. So he, we can know that he is that because when you're his, you belong to him forever. And therefore, yesterday's distress, today's distress, and tomorrow's distress are equally covered by the same covenant promise-keeping God. Because he maintains his covenants. Make no doubt, man does not uphold the covenants that God makes. He gives the strength that man may participate in his covenants, true. But he's the, the covenant maintainer. And when we see David say, I've kept my vows, David is acknowledging his participation in the Mosaic covenant. There is a part that I play. I love you. I commit my vows to you. I devote my life to you. When my wife and I made our vows to each other, it was for, for this entire life, this entire life, to, to our death do us part. He commits his vows to the Lord. So we see God maintains his covenants and he invites David's participation. And how is David participating today? Is he going down and sacrificing an animal or, or, or memorizing some scripture? He's crying out to God in his distress, and even that is part of participation in the covenant. Because being covenanted with God means you have a strong tower, and crying out in your distress is part of your participation in his promises. So this side of human history, this side of the cross, what does that look like for us? Because I'm sure we, most of us know, and if you don't, let's, let's acknowledge it. We're not in the Mosaic covenant time of history. We are under 
the covenant, the new covenant that we celebrate every time we take communion. What do we say? We, we quote one, or one of three different passages of Scripture. We're on the night Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and, and he broke the bread and he passed it around the table. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup in the same way after dinner and he said, this is the new covenant. Amen, sister. This is the new covenant, which is in my blood given for you. As often as you drink it, remember me. So we're in a little different place. We don't look back to tents, do we? What do we look to? Hallelujah. We look to the cross. We look back to the cross and say, Lord, you're the God you were then giving your son for the forgiveness of my sins. And therefore, I know today in my present distress, whether it's yesterday's, today's, or tomorrow's distress, you're the same covenant-keeping God who has forgiven my sins and not only offered to free me from the distress of sin itself, but the, the mediocre, mundane, everyday distresses of, of common life on this earth in the fall. So long as I live and breathe on this earth, I can cry out to God through that covenant because that's how he relates to us is through the covenants he makes with man. So I, I evoke the covenant, Lord, you are my God. You gave your son for me. I know who you are, uh, and I love you, and I see who you are from your word, and I, I, I need your help. So we still cry the same, though. Similarly, he's still our rock. We still catch the illustrations that matter, that he's an immovable rock, that he is a strong tower for his people to run into. We look to the cross, and we take refuge in the shadow of his wings. So how do we participate in the covenant, though? That's the thing that's also a little different. We participate in the covenant by taking communion. It's, it's good for the church that we do this. We participate in the covenant by being baptized. We participate in the covenant by promoting and seeking unity amongst the body of which we are all members. We participate in the covenant by loving the people of God, by learning from the Word of God, and living by the Spirit of God, yielding to the Spirit of God, and performing the mission of God together. Like Dr. Thomas. 17 years. It's hard to fathom. 17 years. Really, to put it into perspective, is difficult. But whether the distress is like the distress of David, which was a shorter-term distress at the time, and whether it's David looking back to the tents and saying, Lord, you're a covenant maker, a covenant keeper. Keep your covenants, God. I trust you to keep your covenants. Or you're like Dr. Thomas saying, Lord, I felt the call to India. It's not happening. Preserve me that the gospel may continue throughout all India until you return. Or it's us in our present distress. Lord, I remember the cross. The cross is my hope. And in this present distress, it gives me hope for now and for eternity. Preserve me that what I do to participate in your mission may continue on for generations in my little corner of the world or any number of other people I could mention and their stories of seeking distress based on the promises of who God is, we all take refuge. We all take refuge in the same strong tower. So take refuge in this, this morning, my friends. Let's pray. Father, what a God you are. What a God you are. You are the rock that is higher than us. And Lord, we, we ask for forgiveness for the times that we are faint. And all we want is freedom from the feeling of faint. And we don't actually want to be brought closer to the rock. Would you forgive us of missing the point of suffering? Would you, in our distress, teach us to thirst for you more than for freedom from the distress? We thank you that you are our strong tower, not our last line of retreating protection, but you are the victor already and a strong tower into whom we run celebrating and worshiping and cheering. May we dwell in your tents forever. Would you lead us to desire that community with you, unending worship of you, and we thank you for the days that the shadow of your wing is clearly felt, for all the times that we, will we won't even know until eternity, all the days you comfort us, comforted us. We thank you so much that when we are 
sometimes ignorant or weak, to even cry out, you are still persistent in loving us and providing yourself as a strong tower into which we take refuge. May you preserve the spiritual lineage you've produced in each of us who believe. We have some of us biological heritage of the Lord, and some of us have been poured into by the people of God, and we see our spiritual lineage coming from Sunday school teachers and pastors and, and friends and other people who you used as a spiritual heritage to pour into us. May the distresses of this life never stop your mission, never stop your works. And when we are distressed, may we cling to the things you've promised in moving forward toward that which you have planned. We bless your name this morning, Father, our, our great strong tower. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.